Definitely. Um, he didn't leave that long ago and he's definitely not an old, old boy. He's definitely sort of a young, old boy. Um, and Chris is currently at um, the University of York um, and he has always taken advantage of every opportunity on offer to him. Um, he works still very closely with MCS and he's just been telling me about that. And he um, offered to run a session about making the most, most out of volunteering, which should be benef very beneficial, particularly for lots of the lower six um, and year 11s this summer. So I'll hand over to you, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Mrs. Smee. Um, so welcome to everyone. Uh, as Mr. Smee said, I'm Chris and I study at the University of York and um, I study maths uh, for anyone who doesn't know. So uh, quite an intense subject. So something that does have a lot of contact hours. So for those of you who are starting to think about university and the kind of course that you want, it means that there isn't a lot of time to do a lot. So you've kind of got to find really strategic ways to be able to fit things in. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment. <laughs> Um, so just to kind of tell you what I'm going to go over, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience about volunteering and kind of what kind of allows me to talk to you about volunteering and just so that you know I'm not just a randomer kind of turning up and just reading some stuff out from random places. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about how volunteering can give you CV skills, so things that you can put on LinkedIn for those of you who have started thinking about LinkedIn and professional profiles online. Uh, those of you that you can kind of put skills into, you know, those key skill areas on your CVs and then also bits that can potentially go into personal statements and things that come along later. Then I'm going to talk about some online opportunities that are really great, sort of, and not just the conventional sort of volunteering that you think about. And then also talk about how you can get involved with some local opportunities. Um, with the way that my screen's set up, I can't see if anybody's got any questions or anything, but I'll kind of just wait till the end. And if anybody's got any questions, uh, then feel free to ask at the end if that's OK. Um, cool. So, um, the first thing I want to start with is there is this kind of very cushy thought about volunteering that you should be doing something completely out of the goodness of your own heart, that you should be 1000% dedicated to that cause. And very much what I've tried to do at York through sort of my vision of volunteering and sort of like talks with people is making people see that volunteering should be a two way deal. You should get just as much as the other side. So it shouldn't be you giving up hundreds of hundreds of hours for what could potentially just be classed as sort of free labor. You know, because a lot of places do do that. They allow you to volunteer and you don't really get anything out of it, but they get hours of manual labor or manual working. And you should be able to walk away with some sort of skill set. So this is uh, me, as you can see in the photo. Some may argue my hair got worse, but I at least got a tan. Um, and I've been the volunteering officer for UC, so that's the York University Students Union, for over three year uh, period. So at first it was alongside my friend Morgan on the left, and then it was alongside my friend Will on the right. And this is an elected position. So the whole of the university body, uh, I put myself forward and said, I want to do that job. And they had to elect us in as a pair uh, to work on that role. And in that role, we've started to develop lots of different volunteering strategies for around the university, but also the city of York. So you can see I've sort of listed some around the edge. So we've got York students in schools. So that's kind of your typical, you know, students going in as teaching assistants and helping younger kids and doing all sorts of stuff. And I was part of the Maths Excellence Club. We've got projects that from the Students' Union, so they're completely student-run projects. So, for instance, the one I've listed there is Night Safe, because that's one I take part in, and that's where we go out into the city. Uh, we help people who are vulnerable or found themselves in a sort of dodgy position on night out, or potentially the homeless, and are helping link them with local charities like Streetlink. We've got some inter-student volunteering opportunities. So this is something that lots of organisations don't class as proper volunteering because it's just inter-student or inter-collegiate. Um, but at the same time, it's something that you can still get a skill from, and that's sort of mentoring. So I assume it's still there. When I was there in sick form, there was a peer support programme, and that is volunteering, but it's inter-student volunteering. We then finally have York students in the community, and that's a bit more like your traditional volunteering as you would expect. So Snappy is a charity that works with children with disabilities and providing them with physical education. And then Sash is a charity that helps homeless people get back on their feet and rehabilitate them. Um, so yeah, this, this sort of slide that kind of tells you about some of the things I've been involved in, and then also kind of tells you about the different types of volunteering that you can kind of go down the stuff and sort of the students in schools, which is very traditional, but also getting new work experience. You've got things that are helping the community. And you've got things that are a little bit closer to home that are more just the skill basis. I've 
sort of mentions this whole sort of skill basis sort of from the previous slide and stuff about you should get stuff out of volunteering that isn't just you know you going and saying you've been there and done that and so i've broken them down into sort of four key areas of things that you can put into your cv or potentially if you're ever going for an interview that you might get asked by the interviewer you know when was the time that you had to demonstrate this skill or when was the time that you had to show you did this and to be perfectly honest with universities it's more likely as well in cases of where you do have to go for some sort of interview you might be asked where did you do this so just to sort of talk through these a little bit we firstly got communication so of course it's really important in life that you should be a key communicator that most jobs you will have to do these days will involve communication we've seen sort of merchants going into the virtual world and that you've had to use online communication with that and so that's a really sort of big key skill and when I say communication I don't just mean being able to talk to people I mean being able to write coherently so to be able to write good emails uh, be able to write a good amount of data so if you're having to pull together data and being able to explain what it means that's important being able to use online equipment like Word, PowerPoint, uh, Skype for business, emails they're all under communication bracket and uh, out of the four in there, that is by far the thing that you're going to ever talk about the most in your life, mainly because you're going to be communicating with people and they're going to ask how you do that. Naturally, that sort of leads on to teamwork and leadership. So we most of the time do expect people to work in teams. You sort of work within classes whilst you're at school. You all have to work on teams on projects and stuff. And there's sort of loads of bits and bobs that you've probably already done that you don't realise. And if there's one thing that I can sort of say for you to go away today and do, is to think about times in the past where you've used teamwork and think about how they could be applied to then go and say you've done that so that you can then get further experience within that field. And of course with teamwork comes leadership because every team needs a leader in some sort of way. Um, some may argue that and say that everyone should be the leader but it, ultimately someone will end up leading or there might be multiple leaders within a group that will help a project come together. Thirdly, challenges to face. So volunteering often will provide quite big challenges. So one natural example is if you were working in a soup kitchen at Christmas, there might be some people who um, are not familiar with the environment and that don't particularly go well with social interaction with other people. So uh, members of the local community who aren't housed perhaps would be a challenge to face both for yourself in communicating with that person, but then potentially if they did become raucous or if there's any issues with uh, other people. And so, Volunteering itself can provide you with challenges to face and that is often a key question on everything and anything, you know, sometimes it's just within your academic studies, you know, it's when did you face a challenge, sometimes it can be in real life and if you can give something that is both not wholesome but, you know, sort of quite nice to be able to say you did that because it was volunteering but you also dealt with it in a professional manner, it shows that you apply yourself consistently no matter what the task is that you have to hand. Finally, I've sort of lumped this into one big bracket, but professional skills. So uh, professional skill could be anything from, you know, you being able to do a piece of research efficiently, which we'll kind of touch upon in some volunteering in a moment, um, or being able to efficiently handle a certain piece of equipment that you would have to make something with. So for instance, I've seen that the a DT department at uh, MTBS have been making um, face guards and stuff for the NHS. That is volunteering, but then the people that have been involved in that project, um, if they didn't already have the skills of gained the professional skills of working that machinery and working to those specs and designs. So there are professional skills that can be taken from the whole volunteering experience as well. So they're the kind of main four. I'm about to go into sort of some more details of specifically online stuff first, uh, because I do think that is key at the moment, especially with the climate that we're sort of living in. And these four circles will sort of appear on each slide for where they're relevant. So they're not all going to be always relevant, all volunteering opportunities, but that can help you tailor what you want to get out of volunteering. Because if you sort of know you're a key communicator, you know, you've got everything that you possibly want there, then the best thing probably isn't to go for a volunteering opportunity that you're only going to get communication skills out of. It's worth you sort of evaluating and not just jumping into the volunteering pool because at the end of the day, as I said, sort of on the previous slide, you should get just as much as the other party out of the whole thing. So it's very important and very key that uh, you do sort of evaluate what you want to get out and see what you need to get to kind of build a full picture on your sort of spectrum of 
things that you need to do. So to move on, I just want to quickly introduce a, vol uh, a volunteering definition. So um, at York, we very much use this and it's very widely known stuff within the uh, volunteering network of students. It's called micro volunteering. So people always say, oh, you know, volunteering, I've got to go and work in a charity shop for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, then I can finally say, oh, I did that. So the whole point of micro volunteering is it really takes out that aspect of being overly committed to an activity. As I said, I study maths. I've never had a lot of time to do one individual thing, but I've got lots of little individual slots where I can pick up little things to do. And micro volunteering is about giving your time, doing a small activity, that would seem normal or recreational to oneself. So it's something that is quite enjoyable, but it actually helps volunteering in some sort of way. And well, all the opportunities I'm going to show are sort of mainly micro-volunteering based, apart from the in-person ones. Um, but even still, some of those can be micro-volunteering opportunities because they are just sort of one-off opportunities. And that is something that all people have sort of wanted at York, because as you can imagine, students, sort of even yourselves and playing students in sixth form, don't have a lot of time. You're studying for, well, hopefully studying for A-levels or GCSEs or some sort of academic qualification or you've got work to do from school that you've not got days and days and days to give up like some people do. So to move on, as I said, um, we'll talk about online opportunities first. So it's very key as a student looking to go towards university or an apprenticeship or some sort of scheme after school that you could think about assisting research and learning in terms of getting that extra experience. And so with this, provide professional skills and then also key communication skills. So I've listed four things around the edge here. Um, I'll kind of go from top left and work around clockwise. So the first one to talk about is Zooniverse. So this is an online volunteering opportunity where you can aid actual research. So if you kind of go on Zooniverse today, you'll see that there's lots of research being done around COVID-19. Um, but all people who are researching don't have time to do the sort of data analysis. They don't have time to simply, you know, set their own copy and paste across all the different cells and all the different things that you need to look at. Or they don't have time to format some of the research into kind of key looking documents. And this is where you can really come in and use some of the skills, you know, that you've been learning since about year four when you were doing making posters back in junior school. And you can actually say, OK, well, I can give my time to make sure that that research looks nice and assist. And it's not as open as, you know, you kind of just having to do whatever you think's best. You know, the person who is leading that research will give you the key things that you should look at or the key things that you need to do with sort of like tick list. And it sounds to you to do as much or as little as you like. You can sort of just log on, see what you need to do. And past COVID-19, there's loads of things. So the stuff is in transcripting old documents of plays from the Roman times that have been found and you having to sort of like piece together from the photos and stuff. So Zooniverse is a really sort of fun activity that you can do, but also then say, well, I've assisted in this piece of research and in this piece of learning, but I volunteered my time. So again, you're sort of having to work on that communication because you're having to talk to the people who are uh, doing all the stuff through email or through the online setup. And then you're also getting that professional skill of doing something towards what you like to study. So really key thing there. Plus that, we've then got missing maps. Um, so what this is, it's a, Missing Maps is a humanitarian mission to try and map where people could be vulnerable within the third world and looking where humanitarian organisations could be of aid. So I'm not particularly familiar with Missing Maps for myself that much. I've not actually done anything myself there. But the Missing Maps whole thing can sort of like be used sort of graphically looking at districts within Africa and saying, OK, well, you know, simply from Google Maps, I can see that there are tribes living in that area or you know they're within um slums of some country that there are children because you can physically see people on a map living there and that is where there are vulnerable people who could need extra help so again you're going to have to work on communication skills you're going to have to be professional and that could be something that could go in sort of either history or if you're wanting to do sort of geography based things or anything that kind of meets some sort of like socioeconomic needs that's a really great volunteering opportunity. And that quite nicely goes into Translation Without Borders. This is a little bit more of a specialist one and is more applicable to anyone who's done a language sort of up to A level or AS standards, sort of first year A level standard. Um, but if you are, class or if you're naturally fluent from home, um, so if you're fluent in another language and when they say fluent, they do allow sort of some leniency. 
then Translation Without Borders is a thing where you can translate medical texts and crisis responses from different countries and have to translate that as accurately as possible so that doctors over in this country and in other countries that are more well off can assist those in other countries when they don't have the translation skills themselves. So, you know, if there's kind of like a report of um, someone needing medical assistance because they've had a heart attack, and then you can kind of be like, well, that is roughly speaking, you know, if something's happened with their heart. If you've kind of got a level of translation to that kind of skill, it's really, really good. Um, and I definitely see, look at having a go. Past that, you can then look at maybe, you know, looking at how you can extend your skills in translation and your skills in different languages, because that is always really key, and then go on to do some volunteering. So use these as sort of like triggers to see how you could then further your own self. So lastly, um, we've got FIO uh, in assisting research and learning. And FIO is where you, <laughs> it's kind of a bit more for the mind, any, if anything, but it's quite literally you just solve online puzzles. And they are very much in the sort of like format of you know, the little year seven and eight drag and drop kind of boxes. But what it, you're actually helping doing is helping genetic disease research. And so when you do that, you're sort of solving little bits of the puzzle and applying your own mind to seeing how things would fit together. Um, so with FIRE, there's not necessarily right answers for anything you do, but everything you do counts towards a computer actually testing that and seeing whether it works or whether it's going to help the genetic disease research that is going on. So as I said, four things there that you can be assisting research and learning. They are volunteering. It's I want to kind of really push this home that volunteering isn't just being stood behind a till in a charity shop. Volunteering isn't just going and helping out at uh, a food bank. Volunteering is giving your time up for anything that is useful and c helps to a committed purpose. And these are all things that do that. So past that, now to look at a bit more interpersonal volunteering. Um, so these are things that, again, are going to require communication, but maybe not as much, um, but certainly going to be really challenges to face and also some really key teamwork and leadership things. Applying for jobs, sort of in the future, or even just temp jobs, they look for very things like empathy. You know, you need to be able to communicate with customers or clients or people that you're going to be working with, you know, whether it's a typical kind of word of service users that you might have to use. Even universities look for that. They want people with personality and especially for people here, you know, with everything that's going on in the world, with universities potentially going online, with stuff kind of changing, the university pool is only going to get more and more competitive over the next couple of years. And so if you've got something that is really key, like an interpersonal volunteering skill, that sets you aside. And you can kind of say, oh, yeah, I've done that. That is something that is just a bit different. And that is what everyone's going to be looking for over the next few years. Different ways about going about different things. So again, I'll kind of just go from the top left hand side and uh, go around clockwise. So the first thing is postcards. Um, postcards is a really sort of wholesome and nice activity that you can get involved in, that even today you could go away and do this right now. So Postpals is a website that has lots of children who are seriously ill um, and their siblings in the UK, and you can write them a letter. So it's as simple as, you know, you write a letter, a little handwriting thing. It gives you a sort of profile of what they like, you know, if they like Power Rangers or if they like toy cars, and you can draw a sort of toy car on your cars, and you can kind of just wish them well. Um, so these are all children who will brighten their day to have a letter from someone, to know that there's someone out there rooting for them. And so that is something that's really key. And I think, especially with that one, it's a challenge to face because it's a challenge yourself to have to emotionally deal with that and emotionally deal with the thought and the process that's going to go behind that. The great thing is um, you don't have to do letters or anything. So they've actually extended. It used to just be like you do cards and send them off and someone will check them. You can now do emails because, of course, these days it's actually a lot more risky to receive a card or a letter. Um, especially for some of these children who are quite terminally ill. So check that one out. It's a really great micro volunteering opportunity that we run at York quite regularly because university students have a great time sort of just writing a letter and it can actually be quite grounding and quite give you the sort of realisation that although there's lots of things going on in the world, that something small like that and helping someone else's life can be effective just as much as giving five pounds or giving some money to do something towards something. It, it's another way to help um, Be My Eyes, again, is another great program um, that is actually supporting a blind or low vision person through some visual assistance software. So it's uh, someone who might be uh, professionally working or that someone who might need it in terms of a medical application of some sort. And uh, you basically 
uh, join the call uh, with them, but with your video and stuff off, and you can then sort of like type out what is happening if someone is blind, um, so that they can hear it instead, or um, it's lots of different ways of running that software. And there's lots of things to kind of like level how comfortable you are with that. And again, it's a nice bit of interpersonal volunteering. The really great thing with all these things, and you sort of, well, before I talk about the last two, is they are all safe to you. Because of course, the other thing that you need to consider with volunteering is never putting yourself in a vulnerable or risky position just to help someone else. So a very classic example is uh, for anyone who's a first aider, um, you know, first aid is volunteering when you learn to do that qualification and stuff. But the, you're always taught as a first aider, don't put yourself in danger because then that could potentially put something else to happen and then there's more to sort out or more to have to do. So these are all supported things that have safeguarding procedures locked in and have all sorts of things built in to make sure that you can be safe and as comfortable as you want to be whilst you're doing that volunteering. So that's a really key thing for me to note. I maybe should have said that a little bit earlier. Um, so then Dementia Friends, again, is quite similar to Post Pals um, and quite self-explanatory. So you can sign up to be a Dementia Friend. Um, and part of this is more uh, education for yourself. So you get to kind of learn about dementia and learn about how dementia operates. And then you can start to become a Dementia Friend to someone in your area. And you get specialised training of how to link with that person and how to make sure that you are safe in doing so. And sort of obviously the key challenges that come about that. And I think... Um, a dementia friend and just so, sometimes it's as simple as writing to them because that can be the best method of communication that they will recognize and they'll understand that whilst they might not remember you that that is coming from someone that they should know and so that can be easy and that obviously does build a real challenge to face because you know one week someone might not remember you and then that's quite hard and it builds emotionally resilience but also it builds empathy and sort of this whole teamwork kind of strategy because with all these things you're having to work as a team with that charity providing that opportunity and sometimes you're having to take the leadership in that decision and say okay well this is how I'm going to progress it's really great the final one on this slide is the mix so the mix is a support charity for those um age 16 to 25 and um you can volunteer and it's peer-to-peer -peer volunteering so a lot of the time there's sort of like forums and chat rooms um, but other times you can actually volunteer further within the organisation uh, and not just do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, basis. But there's all sorts and sometimes it can be as simple as just having a conversation with someone who's having a low day. Um, and other times it can be sort of just supporting some sort of campaign that the mix are running and seeing how you can get involved. Again, I've used that word campaign, that's different. You know, to say you've been involved in a campaign is very different to saying you were involved in a project. So. A campaign is different in the way that it kind of looks to solve a cause, but it doesn't actually mean to have a final end goal. That is the sort of difference between a campaign and a project. But say you've been involved in one, it's great. There's even a button on LinkedIn for it. So for any of you that do have LinkedIn, you can kind of go and look and you can say that you've been involved in a certain campaign. And I think addressing sort of everything that's going on in the world right now, there's so many campaigns going on. You know, it's such a great thing to be involved with. And the mix is one thing that you can show that you're very much there to support other peers. Again, not to kind of bang on towards university too much or towards an apprenticeship too much. But when you start to think about those things, if you can say, well, I support my peers by doing this set of volunteering, you again, you set yourself different from the rest of the crowd when you're applying to that university. Because ultimately, the way university rankings are done are by student satisfaction. They know if they've got students coming in who are going to care about each other. They're going to get a better student satisfaction. You're going to have a better chance of getting into that university. So really great sort of way to look at that. So now to just move on to some of the local opportunities that you can look at. So uh, I put local COVID opportunities mainly because obviously that, that is the big sort of thing right now. Um, I, I think that's maybe an understatement. It's the only thing right now. And um, other local opportunities obviously include sort of going into charity shops and doing that sort of thing, you know, taking things to other people and, you know, all the, all the conventional things I think would be too unvaluable to put in this because I think most people would know how to go and find those sort of opportunities. Um, but these are different things that, especially for uh, testing times, I was going to say trusting times, but testing times where you have to be trusted. And they are going to bring you some challenges to face. And of course, the main things that you need to think about when taking part in any sort of COVID opportunity at the moment is, are you going to be safe? Are you going to put anybody else at risk? So whilst these are all sort of like with professional organisations, you may come into contact or be near someone 
and whilst most of you are young and healthy, all the people around you and your family. So it's all just thinking about those little things and how that slots together. But also communication and professional skills. If you can say that you helped out in the time of a global pandemic, not only will it be a great thing to, to come over the few years of looking for jobs, applying things, you know, progressing your career, progressing your life, be a great story to tell grandkids when you're about 60 and say you actually made a difference. So going from the top again, uh, there's a sort of supporting local food banks. So uh, this is called the Trussell Trust. Um, and that is where you can either donate or you can make an online food delivery. So potentially this is something that you and your family could do. Um, or you can volunteer at your local food bank. Again, that is down to whether it is safe and healthy for you to do so and that you're not going to impact anybody else around you. Um, so really great. I'll put the website there. Um, as Mrs. Mead said, um, this is being recorded, so I assume everyone can get access to it. But um, I will send this presentation over to Mrs. Mead as well so that she can share the links for anybody who wants to click on them. So I'll include the links here. Past that, we've got uh, NHS volunteering uh, responders. Um, so this is all sort of what people have been doing since the start of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. So this is the whole going and dropping uh, medicines around to people, um, going and delivering uh, food shopping, you know, to those who are vulnerable who can't get out of the house. We yesterday sort of saw a change in attitude from the government towards who can go out, but there are still those who are having to isolate. There's still those who are having to keep themselves safe. And so this is more than ever going to be key for young people like yourselves who are going to have potentially a little bit more time on the hands whilst everyone else is going back to work because a lot of the sort of like stabilizers as such are going to be taken off by people who just no longer can do that volunteering because they will need people. Of course, uh, something to be key about is obviously if you're having to, have, you can't do medications and stuff unless you're under 18 to blur those because there is a sort of learn trust and stuff. But there are other things like just making sure you can regularly call in on someone to check how they are whilst they're isolating. It's really great. Um, and it's called Good Samp App. Um, so that's uh, really good. And that's forward slash NHS. As I said, we'll send these links on afterwards. Then uh, the last one is COVID Mutual Aid. So uh, this is where you will find uh, sort of all the COVID groups. Someone towards the start of the pandemic um, set up a website, COVID Mutual Aid which brought together a link to all the different aid groups and you can find the local groups. So whether that's Crosby, whether that's Formby, whether that's somewhere in South Liverpool, whether that's Southpool, whether that's over in the Wirral, wherever you are in Liverpool, there will be some sort of COVID mutual aid group. And that is just a very sort of local volunteers group that it will sort of be redirected to of people who just need things. And it'll probably be in the terms of like a Facebook group or an online forum. But again, just be careful to yourself and just make sure you stay safe yourself if you are going to get involved in any of that. Um, always ensure that you've got your parents' consent and stuff like that and that everyone knows what you'll be doing so that you can make sure you stay safe. But again, a really great way to get involved and just make sure that you can give something back to your community, but also get something out of it. So I want to sort of, before I sort of take some questions in a moment, uh, I know I've talked very quickly, um, so I'm happy to go back through anything anybody wants, or if anybody wants to note down something, you can say in a moment. But I want to really, really try to hammer home that this volunteering is just as valuable as work experience or real life jobs. The whole sort of premise of this presentation was this summer is going to be hard to get jobs. It's going to be hard to get any sort of work experience because a lot of things are either just going to be cancelled or not open or just not allowing applications at the time. So doing a bit of volunteering, getting involved with places that will take you on, and it, no matter how long or short that is, and especially with micro-volunteering, because it means that you can do lots of different things, you can get all those skills that are just as important and make sure that you get just as much out of it. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so I can actually go back to the in a moment. Um, there we go. So hopefully everyone can still see me. Um, yeah. There we go. Thank you, Chris. That was excellent. Some really, really good ideas, actually. And I think lots of students are quite anxious, particularly as they had sort of bits of work experience planned and they're starting to put together personal statements. I think it's quite an anxious time. So I think all of that is really, really good stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we've got a couple. Does the volunteering that you do have to be related to what you want to do in the future? It depends. Um, if you're doing something like medicine, um, you might want to sort of get a head start and sort of say, you know, oh, I want to do something that's a little bit more towards um, something that's going to help me in that career path. But ultimately, no. 
Um, the main thing is making sure, as I've kind of tried to say, the skills. It's more the skill that you get out of it that will be more useful. And if you've actually got something that isn't directly related to what you want to do, might actually impress them a little bit more because they can actually say like, oh, okay, that they don't just, they're not just one person who does one thing with their life. They go and do other things and they recognize that there is other outside stuff. So depending on your career path, potentially, but I'd ultimately say no, just look for those skills. Um, another question here. Is it still worth doing volunteering jobs after personal statements have been sent to universities? Uh, that's an interesting one. I, I suppose that's a little bit more of a sort of own moral question. I would always say yes, um, because even after a personal statement has been sent to a university, there is a bit of uncertainty about how universities are going to be continuing that process. You know, uh, for instance, at York, um, because I, I do a lot of student ambassador work, I know that we're going to be operating a lot more interviews and things, especially for the maths department. So there is the potential. That this, or I've done this differently. So I'd say yes, but ultimately don't let it get in the way of work. You know, it's almost volunteering should be an extra that you do for enhance. It shouldn't replace any school work or anything like that. So if it, you haven't got the time, then fair enough. Okay, I can't see any further questions. I think what I'll suggest is that, Chris, if you could send me the presentation, then I'll upload that onto Firefly um, this afternoon. And if you and I hang around for the next couple of minutes, just in case anybody, anybody would rather answer, ask a question in a small group, does that sound OK? Yeah. Um, and fine. I just want to say thank you ever so much for sharing your time and expertise, Chris. That was really, really valuable. Um, and thank you to everyone that attended. Um, if you don't have a question, you're more than welcome to leave. People are saying thank you in the comment box, Chris. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> oh, there you go. No worries. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Oh, yeah, loads of thank yous. Big, cheers, big Chris. <laughs>